between 2009 and 2017 in the US. And you can see that among the 5 million of patients undergoing PTI, 10.6% uh, of patients underwent PCI for intrastent stenosis lesions. Uh, patients with uh, Bermidine declined from 2.6 in 2009 to 0 0.9 in uh, 2017. But patients with drug eluting in stress tantric rose from 5.4 to 6.3. It's because the use of DES has become much wider and the use of BMS has declined with time. This is the data from Sirtax trial. No, no, uh, this Philip, we, we see only one slide, which you managed to institute. The, it's, it's not uh, moving your slides. Oh, can you, show you have only show? the first slide? Can you make a full screen? Full screen, please. I'm Full screen, and then because it's only one slide, so in management instant issues, and that's it. Full screen. Yes, please. Like that? Yes, okay, we get it. Yes, go ahead. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. So, uh, did you see this slide? Just, just now. Okay, so these are the data from the NCDR. Uh, temporal trends in uh, intrastent uh, restenosis PCI between 2009 and 2007, data from the US uh, experience. And you can see that among 5 million uh, patient PCI, 10.6% uh, of patients underwent PCI for intrastent restenosis lesions. Interestingly, uh, patients with bare metal stent intrastent restenosis declined. Uh, from 2.6% in 2009 to 0.9% in 2017. And drug eluting stent restenosis uh, PCI rose from 5.4 to 6.3 uh, in 2017. This is uh, just uh, because the use of DES has become much wider and the use of BMS has declined over time. So these are the data from the CIRTAX trial, 10-year follow-up, where you can see that ischemia-driven TLR is a very early uh, event after PCI because half of the ischemia-driven TLR are occurring within one year after PCI and half, the second half becoming uh, occurring between year one and year 10. These are uh, the, sorry, just want to remove this. So the, now I cannot change my slides. Okay. So these are the data from uncomplicated TLR after PCI in 21 randomized trials, meta-analysis, 32,000 patients. And you can see that the prognosis of intrastent uh, restenosis PCI is, is worse compared to no TVR lesion. You can see that uh, prognosis in terms of death in TLR PCI is 12.2% of death at five years. It's 11.7% in TVR PCI, whereas it's only 35% less, 8.9% in no TVR PCI. And this is uh, associated and driven by higher rates of myocardial infarction after TLR PCI. As you can see here, patients with TLR PCI at 6.8% MI at five years which compares defavorably uh, with the 4.0 and 4.2% uh, rates of MI in patients treated for uh, no TVR PCI. So what are the mechanisms of uh, intrastent tristinosis? You know that the mechanisms are, are uh, due to patient characteristics, lesion characteristics, and procedure characteristics. From the patient, we know 
that diabetes mellitus and genetic factors may play a very important role. From the lesion, we know that the lesion length, complexity, presence of osteal lesion, bifurcation lesion, small vessel, and drug distribution may play an important role in increasing the rate, the risk of intracentric stenosis. And from the procedure, we have the stent type, number of stents, stents overlap, under expansion, geographical miss, and stent fracture. So you may have a combination of all of this that may increase the risk of intrastent pristinosis after PCI. The timing of intrastent pristinosis is made of two main mechanisms, neo-intima hyperplasia and neo-atherosclerosis. So you can see from this work from Song uh, four years ago that uh, stent under expansion is the main mechanism in early uh, PCI occurring less than one year after implantation. And uh, the risk of neo-entimal hyperplasia is, main, is the main mechanism in late instant stenosis beyond one year. You may have a mixed proportion of the two different mechanisms, but the distribution is like that, under expansion, early stenosis, high rate of neo-entimal hyperplasia, late stenosis. New antimal proliferation is done, is obtained after me mechanical mechanism like under deployment, geographical miss and stent fracture, but also biological mechanism. You know that coating injury has been involved in some restenosis and thrombosis, drug distribution, resistance to antiproliferative drugs and late hypersensitivity may play a role in increasing new antimal proliferation. These are interesting examples of uh, the mechanism and the use of uh, stent enhancement techniques. You can see here on the top panel on the left, you have a nice example of a stent fracture. You can see that there are two different uh, parts of the stent, one on the left, one on the right, and that the place of the marker you see here, there is no stent because the stent has been fractured. You can see that in in some uh, right coronary artery uh, most of the time, but you can see that also in some uh, uh, segments of the left. On the top right panel, you can see a clear under, under deployment of the stent in the mid part. You can see here that the stent is not at the vessel wall, uh, which is the main mechanism of uh, instant restenosis, but it's not really instant, it's uh, in-segment restenosis because the stent has not been fully deployed uh, at, the, at the, the index procedure. On the bottom panel, you can see some example of longitudinal compression. You see here we have uh, more than one layer of struts, which is pathognomonic of the presence of uh, the stent compression, as you can see here. You have shortening of the stents and the struts are coming one on the other and you may have like that uh, mechanical uh, mechanism uh, related to instant stenosis. So uh, what about late uh, events? You can see that neoatherosclerosis is most likely to occur beyond one year and the rate of stenosis and ischemia driven TRR is about 1.8% per year between year one and year five, and is about 0.7% per year between year five and year 10. So the, the risk is still here, late after PCI, but it's decreasing over time, but still existing till 10 years. This is a very interesting study by Nakazawa, uh, showing the incidence and timing of atherosclerotic change. And you can see that with drug eluting stent, we have much less neointimal hyperplasia, but we may have more atherosclerotic, atherogenotic plaque, change plaque within the segment. It may be like uh, up to 50% at uh, 12 to 15 months, but this occurs very late with the BMS PCI, as you can see here. What are the available data? We had data from different techniques to treat instant pristinosis. We have this 
a very interesting series of trials by the Spanish technique uh, by Alfonso. This is the ribs 3 uh, data from restenosis, intrastent, balloon angioplasty versus drug eluting stent. And you can see that uh, the strategy in this trial was to use a drug eluting stent, switching the drug uh, to treat an instant restenosis. And you see in terms of MACE at four years, the, the, uh, the, the freedom free from MACE was 77% with DES strategy and it was 65% with another strategy which was statistically significant. In terms of TLR, we have 81% uh, risk of TLR with DES and we have 72 all strategies, meaning that this is the best strategy in all, in all the literature. The, the, the main result is this. DCB is very good too, much better than PES, SES, brachytherapy or, or for sure BMS. And PMS is, PES, sorry, is a good, good alternative compared to brachytherapy or BMS. So we, we also had very nice uh, studies from the ISAR uh, group. This is the ISAR Desire 4 uh, trial comparing two strategies, uh, 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 mixed strategies using angioscope scoring balloon plus Pantera Lux, uh, which is a, uh, uh, Paclitaxel eluting balloon and uh, versus uh, versus normal balloon plus pantralux. And you see here that in terms of uh, binary restenosis at one year, the strategy was uh, favoring the, the use of a scoring uh, balloon, 18.5% binary restenosis here compared to 32%, and this was statistically significant. But in terms of uh, ischemia-driven target lesion revascularization, the difference was still favoring the mixed strategy, including the scoring, but this was not statistically significant. So what are the remaining questions uh, when uh, dealing with uh, instant restenosis? I mean, what we don't know today is what about the limus uh, eluting balloons? Are they better than Paclitaxel eluting balloons. We have some uh, devices now. We have Magic Touch, but also solution trials are are ongoing with this device. And uh, and we still don't know if these balloons are uh, better than Paclitaxel eluting balloon. Uh, you know that there was uh, uh, some uh, discussion about uh, Paclitaxel eluting balloon, especially in the field of peripheral interventions. Uh, with uh, more drugs, so it could be interesting to have this data. Another remaining question is the role of excipient in this uh, in these uh, interventions, and uh, the the question about should we treat uh, differently early or late restenosis because the mechanism is not the same. In a practical approach, we have this from the guidelines, the last guidelines. And uh, it's good to, to go back to the, to the guidelines to see that uh, restenosis uh, that is associated with angina or ischemia should be treated with repeat revascularization and repeat PCI is the strategy of choice for more of most than these patients. Uh, the results from DES are superior to those obtained from balloon angioplasty, uh, BMS or brachytherapy. In the guidelines, the restenosis is DES recommended for uh, treatment of instant restenosis, class one level of evidence A. Drug coated balloons are also class one level of evidence A. In patients with recurrent episodes of diffuse instant restenosis, cabbage could be an alternative. It's 2A level of evidence C. And the use of IVUS or OCT, but we could also say uh, stent magnification should be considered uh, to detect the, re the mechanisms of uh, restenosis is 2A. So this is the, what uh, we can discuss if you want after this uh, presentation is what to do with instant restenosis. Uh, the question, the first question is should we have to treat this patient? Is there some ischemia? Do we have a positive FFR or not? And if yes, uh, the question is, what are the underlying mechanisms 
And we can have this using stent enhancement, IVOS, and OCT. If the restenosis is focal, so the question is, is it a gap? Is it a fracture? Is it an edge of the device? Is it geographical miss? So if we have a focal uh, restenosis due to one of these, the, 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 what we have to do is to put another D. If it's focal but under expansion, clearly uh, the first of all is to have stent optimization. If we have a stent-like results, so it's not useful to put a second DES. If we don't have, uh, we can use a drug-coated balloon to optimize and to treat the risk of, uh, of uh, a second uh, instant uh, restenosis. If the underlying mechanism is diffuse disease, the question is, is it due to underexpansion, and then we go back to stent optimization, stent-like result, DES or not. If the mechanism is diffused, but not due to underexpansion, so this is place maybe to have a hard team discussion and discussion about the possibility to, to send the patient to the surgeon, especially in lesions of the left atrial descent, uh, 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 LAD. So my, my conclusion uh, is that uh, instant restenosis after second or third generation DS are not frequent. Uh, the identification of the mechanism is crucial for optimal therapeutic decision. The role of instant, of stent enhancement, the role of IVIS, of OCT is very important to show the mechanism of instant restenosis and guide the treatment of these lesions. DES and DCB are best options to treat majority of cases, but surgery may be an option in some cases of diffuse restenosis in complex lesions without underexpansion. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I hope uh, you have questions. And yes, would be thank very you very much, Philippe. Uh, uh, I will start the questions. So in, in, in your last, can you bring your last slide before conclusion to discuss it? Just, just the slide before. Yes, one, please stop here. I think this is the most crucial point for, for all the audience here. So Absolutely. You, yes, you need here detection of ischemia and IVAS, for example, or OCT. Yeah. If, yeah. If you are not depending on angina, if the patient's angina is the only instant resource, no evidence of ischemia, and if you don't have an IVAS or OCT for these patients, depending on the end, you have a focal and diffuse. Regarding the focal, as you didn't mention here the focal, which is the focal, the focal in the mid or the edges or entrance center like before. You know, there's another classification in the, in the past which showed that not only focal and diffuse, maybe, maybe type one, type two, instant stenosis, and maybe intrastental or at the edges. It's not here included in the focal. So this is your modification, you mean? Uh, and then the second question, is, where is the rota here? The rota here or the shock wave? Do you have any evidence of the calcification on, on such instant risk? Because at the, the beginning, the chief asked the question about if you have instant stenosis and calcifications, particularly in the Austrian LED, something. Like, are you going to do rota or shock wave? Do you have evidence of this? So first question, here you can see that the edge and, and gap and geographical mus are included in the focal hyper, hyperplasia. Uh, it's usually focal, sometimes included in diffuse too, but most of the time uh, this kind of uh, problems that we had with the index procedure are leading to focal instantinosis. And for the second question, the second question about rotablator shock wave, yes, we have some data. But as I shown, especially in this work from the Lancet, from this uh, 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 network, we can see that the rotablator has not better results than DES or DCB. So we are not using in routine rotablator for instant restenosis. It, instead, in some cases of patients with neoatherosclerosis and calcified instant lesion. In terms, if it's related to neoantimal hyperplasia, usually the material is quite soft and you can treat it with non-compliant balloon. You can treat it with, with the usual techniques and you don't need to use shockwave or rotor. 
In some patients, we have very late restenosis. We have neuroatherosclerosis. We have some calcified instant lesions. And then, yes, rotablot uh, could, be, uh, could be a very useful help. Uh, Philippe, uh, thank you very much for this uh, illustrative uh, presentation. And what I ask about the re-stent instant stenosis. How to deal with, with balloon or another third stent, drug eluding stent? Can you please repeat that? Uh, uh, you mean re stenosis after you treat the instant re stenosis by DS and then another instant re stenosis for the third time? Are you oh, going to yes. Have third um, jacket three stents inside or, or DCP? Yeah. Yeah. So this is a very interesting question. Uh, I would say that we, we don't have a lot of patients like that, but we all have some patients. You put a DES, you have instant pristinosis, you put a second one inside, it's still okay, but then the patient come back again. And, and the question is what to do with these patients? Uh, I, I did a case like that last week uh, and I tried to, to use a DCB uh, and I said to the patient, I don't want to put a third step because the problem is then that you don't have enough, uh, uh mineral, uh, lumina area to, to have a good, a good uh, um, coloric mm -hmm. few. I, I mean, the, the most, most important is to keep the vessel open, to post dilate all these stents and not to put more than two stents. In some patients with proximal LAD or left main restenosis, recurrent restenosis, the question of surgery is, uh, is, is, should be, should be uh, uh, done by hard team discussion at this time. Uh, a second question, please. Uh, if we find an underexpansion and uh, there is yep. a distance between the already placed stent and the uh, outer layer of the coronary, more than one millimeter, how to deal with? There is a gap in by IVIS, underexpansion, great underexpansion. Under Could you go with uh, balloons only? Uh, how to seal this gap? Because this is a well endothelized stent with true and stent stenosis D2. Uh, a big under expansion. Yeah. Okay. If you have a, a if we have a gap between <laughs> the stent and the outer and the intima, big big gap. How to deal with it? stent like two seventy five and the actual size is four. How to seal this yeah. gap between the stent and the antima? I mean the only the only solution we have is post dilatation. Most of the, the recent stents, there are stem stents 25, 275, 3035. So you can use bigger balloon, like 40 non compliant, and post dilate to 275, and you may increase the diameter of the stent uh, up to the wall or, or quite uh, close to the wall of the vessel. So under expansion, the only solution is to post dilate, no rotablate or nothing else. Post dilate. And then the question is about should we use a DCB or should we use a new to stand? First of all, post dilate. Philippe, we don't see a BMS anymore now, but if I think there's a, a completely different uh, instant resinosis between BMS and DS. So yeah. uh, if you, have, you are confronted now with the BMS, an old BMS, are you just doing a DS, uh, DS now? Don't, don't, don't try to do DCP or uh, uh, balloon dilatation. And for DS, you'd shoot IVAS or you it is the same? Yeah, excellent question. We, we see very, very few BMS restenosis because we don't use BMS anymore. But in some cases, we may have focal uh, instant restenosis in BMS. And then depends on the mechanism. If we have under expansion, we post dilate and then DCB. Not, not always useful to put a DES. If we have uh, something else with diffuse disease, then we can uh, uh, treat the patient. Uh, as I told before, it's the same than the, if we have instant restenosis in DES, then what we do is to change, switch the DES. I'm not sure this, uh, it's a really, um, uh, very, uh, how to say, very recognized strategy, but 
we, we usually change the DES. We say, okay, this patient had the restenosis with this stent, we have to change something. Something was wrong, the stent was well implanted. It's not because of the technique, it's because of the drug, it's because of the polymer, it's because of the platform, I don't know, so we will change. And, and I guess we have good, good results with this and very, very few patients with recurrent instant restenosis. But yes, the mechanism is different with BMS and DES. Adding to the question here, if you have a DES, for example, uh, Zion stent, uh, and you have instant restenosis, are you going to do another Zion? Will you change the, pla to the platform into another stent to another category? Maybe it's not uh, Ceralomus, for example. If you have Pepitaxel or I, I think I would change. I you think change. I would change. You would change. Because we have very good new generation DES. They are quite equal to treat many, many lesions. And if we have a first uh, restenosis within Exiants and the procedure was well conducted, good result, I think I would change. I'm not sure it's, it's a recognized strategy. It's not in the guidelines, but uh, intuitively I would change. Uh, thank you, Philippe. Uh, two questions. The question number one is if I have a, a restenosis in the area of bifurcation, do you think we can do uh, such like a casing balloon with DCB? It will be a solution. And the, another question, do you think there is, uh, uh, as regard the outcome, there is a difference between the serolimus eluting balloon and the baclitaxin coated balloon or not? Thank you for your question. Very interesting again. Uh, the use of drug-coated balloon in osteal and bifurcation lesion is, is really interesting. Because as you know, uh, bifurcation lesion with one stent has very good results, probably better than with two stents. Less restenosis, less reinterventions, and less events. So we want to keep it as simple as possible. We treat 80% of the bifurcation lesion with one stent and the provisional T strategy. The question about how to treat the osteum is very important. The use of DCB is good. We had some data. Not all the trials are, are now uh, uh, finished. We have some ongoing trials, but I guess this could be a very interesting uh, strategy to use DCB to treat the osteum of the cyborg. We have some data of small series and uh, we will have better data of more patients and we will know if the strategy is, is good or not. Okay, last question. The second question, using DCB as kissing balloons, I'm not sure because these, these balloons are not uh, designed to do the kissing. They are not non-compliant. The risk is to use the balloons and have, have some superimposition of delivery in some place. So I'm not sure to doing kiss of DCB is the best option. Yes. And the second question is... Serolimus versus Baclitaxel. Baclitaxel, Serolimus, yes. Magic Doctor. Oh, yes. So we have, we have very few data. We have uh, some trials uh, with the, the solution uh, device ongoing in our center. And uh, we have read, I have read some papers with the, with the, um, uh, I don't know, remember the name of this balloon. I was just presenting here. The magic touch. Magic touch, magic touch yes. yes. Uh, and these are good. These are good. It's, it's interesting to, to have this in our cat labs, uh, both for coronary, but also for peripheral lesions, because uh, we have very good uh, Impression. I don't. I don't have large trials with this device, but we have very good feelings with this uh, device. Uh, we know that uh, we are more confident with Sirolimus compared to Paclitaxel. It's the history, and uh, and I wonder if uh, if this strategy is the best. But uh, I don't know. I, I think we have to wait for for the results of the trial. Okay, last question. Um, if, if I'm dealing with a patient with instant restenosis and I do not, I, and I do not have an IVUS. So my, my advice is to use stent magnification, stent boost, stent Vs. These are, this is the best you can use. It's really easy 
it's uh, it's uh, cheap. Uh, you just put your balloon inside the stent and you do some acquisition and then you see if the stent is at the vessel. You can change the the, the projection of your sea arm and then you will see the stent magnifications in different projections and you may have a very good feeling and a very good uh, um, um, mechanism uh, discrimination with this only uh, stent magnification tool. But sometimes the, 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 um, the stent visualization shows me that the stent is uniform, but the IVA showed that it's not well opposed. Yeah. So, so this is, so in these patients we have uh, not under deployment in terms of uh, heterogeneity, but we have under deployment in total with regard to the vessel wall. So the, the, the best to do is to use the, 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 the balloon, the non-compliant balloon, and to post dilate to the wall of the vessel. So if the question is, should we use IVOS for all these patients? Yes, this is I would exactly say that the not for all, but in some cases, it could play a very interesting role. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Philippe, for this uh, wonderful uh, lecture. Thank you.